Yeah, I mean, this kind of encapsulates one of my major problems with the NRA, which is that it is not a pro-Second Amendment organization. It's just a Republican shill organization with a lot of boomers who don't actually understand gun rights and who just get red meat thrown at them on a number of other topics. Hey guys, you're watching Base Politics Podcast with Hannah Cox and Brad Palumbo. This week, highlights from the NRA convention, Florida moves to expand the death penalty, and a red pill YouTuber calls us out. Let's jump in. The NRA just had its big convention. Uh, folks that don't know, it's a National Rifle Association, the largest kind of pro-Second Amendment group in the country. Uh, Hannah is not a huge fan of the NRA. I've been pretty skeptical of the NRA in recent years. But they are still a major political force with lots of members, and their convention had uh, big names. It really had everybody who was a big name in GOP politics either spoke at the event or appeared virtually with a video message. So you had everyone from Ron DeSantis to smaller names like Vivek Ramaswamy and, in, of course, Donald Trump. So what we're going to do is go through the highlights from this event, starting with a few interesting remarks from Mike Pence, who spoke. Hannah, take a listen to this first clip. So stand with law enforcement, protect our kids. And finally, while the assailants in the most recent attacks were taken out by law enforcement on the scene, too many mass shooters languish in prison for years. Well, men and women, I don't have to tell you, justice delayed is justice denied. It's inconceivable to me that the shooter who killed 17 people at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School in 2018 is languishing in a Florida prison. I believe the time has come to institute a federal death penalty statute with accelerated appeal to ensure that those who engage in mass shootings face execution in months, not years. So Hannah, I can totally see why people would want mass shooters to get the death penalty. Like emotionally and intuitively, that makes sense to me. But I do find the notion that that would be some sort of deterrent to these high profile killings pretty absurd. I think most of the shooters expect their lives to come to an end as a result, uh, regardless. And as more broadly, the death penalty as a deterrent is pretty dubious. I also, the idea of rushing it and doing it in just a few months seems pretty problematic to me from a due process point of view. What, what's your reaction to what Penn says here? Yeah, I mean, this kind of encapsulates one of my major problems with the NRA, which is that it is not a pro-Second Amendment organization. It's just a Republican shill organization with a lot of boomers who don't actually understand gun rights and who just get red meat thrown at them on a number of other topics. Clearly, they're trying to push back on the left because the left wants to use gun control to go after mass shooters. And they're saying, no, 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 the answer is the death penalty. And it's like, no, actually, the answer is prevention. <laughs> Having the death penalty is not a deterrent for anybody, actually. We know that. We've looked at this for many, many decades. There have been tons of studies done. It is absolutely a wash. And in fact, we see states that have gotten rid of the death penalty tend to see a slight drop in homicides. And I would suggest that that is because they then have so much more money to actually try to prevent and solve crime. And that's the real deterrent to violence is the assurance that one will be caught and promptly sentenced um, with the death penalty and really with all murder, you really don't have that assurance in this country because we saw fewer than 60% of all homicides. So I think the death penalty is actually something that leads to more violence and spreads our resources too thin. And I think this is a lot of tough talk. And, you know, this is one of the main reasons I'm no longer a Republican. I don't believe you can actually stand for a limited government, say that the government is corrupt, that it's prone to error, that has all these mistakes, and then argue that you should expedite the government being able to kill its own citizens, that you should remove appeals processes, that you should take it to the federal level, remove it from the states. I mean, this is as big government as it gets. We already know the death penalty is a wash with innocent issues, which we'll get to in our second segment today. But as a whole, there's nothing serious about this talking point. And I really just don't think it appeals to anybody and, uh, younger than 50. <laughs> Yeah, that, it's a wash with issues of innocent people being killed, and we will break that down more in depth later today. But and that's with the current system, where they take mm -hmm. years and years and years and do appeals after appeals. Um, 
he's saying we'll just do it in just a few months. That to me sends a chill down my spine in terms of the number of innocent people that are already executed under the status quo. And then if we expediated it and just truncated the process so much, uh, I don't know, man, that that to me is a giant red flag. But it it's, was kind of par for the course. There was a lot of talk about mental health, about mass shooters from the crime side, get tough on crime um, because they're kind of grasping for an alternative to gun control when I think it's very hard for, for people who are major political figures on either side to admit that like maybe there's nothing the government can do to solve an issue. And so instead of admitting that, which was very hard for people to ever acknowledge on either side, they are grasping for straws at things like the death penalty, which I think pretty clearly can't address this issue. So I want to move on to our second clip here where um, South South Dakota Governor Kristi Noem got mocked because she touted the diversity of the NRA membership. And then for audio uh, for audio listeners, the camera, this pan and the audience is mostly just old white men. Uh, take a <laughs> listen or a watch to this clip. Now, I probably don't look like a traditional NRA member. The media would have us believe that the NRA is only made up of old white guys. And all you old white guys can be proud and raise your hands. But there's a lot of other people, a lot of diversity within the NRA. Well, let me tell you something. I may be a mom and a grandma, but I am the NRA. So optically, this was kind of hilarious because the audience was mostly old white men, as that pan showed. But I don't think she's wrong. I don't know about the NRA specifically, but she's definitely not wrong to suggest that the demographics of gun ownership in America are changing and are becoming much more diverse, including uh, women of color, single moms, all, not just white men have guns anymore. Not, not that that was ever the case, but it's less true than ever. So it was kind of a funny moment that was getting dunked on by liberal media. But I think there's truth to what she's saying. Well, I think there's truth in what you just said. I don't think there's truth in what she was saying. The NRA is mostly made up of old people and of white people. And that's because the NRA is, again, not really a Second Amendment organization. I think if you wanted to look into other Second Amendment organizations, you would find a lot of diversity, like Black Guns Matter that's run by a friend of ours that has a huge diverse population. I think if you go to like uh, Gun Owners of America, they have a pretty diverse population. The NRA again, is more of a Republican shill organization. And the problem with the NRA, my main beef with them, is they don't stand up for the Second Amendment rights of black people. You know, we haven't heard them say a freaking peep when people like Philando Castile, who was gunned down in his car over being a Second Amendment holder, who did everything he was supposed to do in that interaction with a cop, got gunned down by a cop with his daughter in the back seat. Where was the NRA on that? nowhere. They sent for police. They actually will take the side of police against gun owners oftentimes. And so because of that, they are dying. Well, they're dying for many reasons. They have a ton of corruption as well. But that's why their membership base is dying out. And you see other better or organizations propping up to actually defend the Second Amendment. I used to work for one of those um, at the state level called the Tennessee Firearms Association, which was formed because the NRA sucks so bad at defending gun rights. Uh, they worked just in Tennessee to actually push for um, better stringent protections of the Second Amendment. And um, they, at that time, the fastest growing participants at our membership were women and particularly younger women and single women. So I don't know what the stats are off the top of my head at the moment, but we certainly have seen major um, jumps in that demographic. We also see a lot of people of color who carry. And this is, this is something I think that they really miss the boat on is a lot of black people own guns. A lot of black people are believers in the Second Amendment and and understand why you need guns to defend yourself, um, not only in a personal capacity, but against a big government that can take your liberties. And yet these kind of organizations have ostracized people that there could be a lot of um, commonality on an issue with because of their positions on things like policing. Yeah, I, I definitely see that point. Um, but I do I do think the gun rights movement broadly is a much more diverse movement than the sure. left and its critics would give it credit for. Uh, but I'm not sure the NRA has completely caught up with that or is um, it perhaps should be. It's just also the, the convention. I would probably read the room a little before making a statement like that. Um, but 
I get what where she was going with it. This next one, I wasn't quite so sure where he was going with it. So uh, Vivek Ramaswamy, who is a prominent Republican, um, he says that we need to open an NRA branch in Taiwan. Take a listen. You want China not to invade Taiwan? Here's something we can do. The NRA can open its branch next time in Taiwan. And you want to stop Xi Jinping from invading Taiwan? Put a gun in every Taiwanese household. Have them defend themselves. Let's see what Xi Jinping does then. That is what it means to be an actual American. Train them how to use guns, just like we did to black people in this country after the Civil War. Taiwan, we're coming for you. We're with you, Taiwan. Put a gun in every household. China ain't going to do a peep. Xi Jinping got nothing on us. So there's something <laughs> kind of radically cartoonish about his delivery there, um, especially if you've seen him speak in other contexts. He doesn't really always talk like that. So it seemed like he was putting on a little bit of an affect that he thought might pander to this crowd. Uh, I don't know that the NRA will be opening a branch in Taiwan anytime soon, um, but I guess I, I sort of take his point that an armed population is harder to oppress. Um, I, and for example, uh, Hitler famously disarmed the Jews in the lead up to the Holocaust. Uh, but I don't know. I still co color me a little bit skeptical that civilian gun ownership would really stop the military might of the CCP. It might make it harder for them to steamroll through and conquer Taiwan. And that would, I guess, be good. But I don't know that it's solving a potential geopolitical crisis and war is as simple as opening an NRA branch. Yeah, I don't think the NRA is going to do it, but there's a lot to unpack here. First and foremost, basically, he's suggesting we, I think, get involved in another proxy war between Taiwan and China. He wants us to start running arms to Taiwan and, and making sure everybody has a gun. And that just sounds like something we have absolutely no business in getting involved with whatsoever, especially against a nuclear power like China. Like these people cannot think three steps ahead. Like, please stop getting us involved in these conflicts with nuclear powers. I do, I don't think he's wrong that, you know, the Taiwanese arming themselves would be a bad idea. You've seen, the U.S., who has the They're largest military in, in the world, um, be defeated by guerrilla warfare like the Taliban. So, I, you know, to say that these people could not defend themselves against China if they were armed, I don't know that that's definitely you know, so necessarily true. But again, I don't know why this is a talking point at an NRA convention. I'm kind of laughing at the audience members who are sort of like, woo, because they know they're supposed to cheer for this. But I would love to see you know, a handful of them interviewed after the speech and be like, what is the conflict between Taiwan and China? What do you know or about ask them to point to Taiwan on a map? Yeah. Like they don't know anything about this conflict. This is just some random, like, I don't know. This is something the GOP wants. You can tell it like it's a talking point they want. They want us to get involved in the Taiwan conflict with China, but this is not something the average voter knows anything about or thinks about. So it's just kind of funny to see somebody trying to rile up this base over this and then sort of going along with it because they know they're supposed to care about it. But, you know, the vast majority of people in that room know nothing about what he's talking about. So I just thought that was interesting. And then when he said this is what we did to arm the blacks after the Civil War, like, sir, no, we didn't. Actually, we passed a number of gun control laws specifically trying to block former slaves and black people from owning guns to this very day. <laughs> like, what are you talking Maybe about? Maybe it's what we should have done. Yeah. But it's not what we did. <laughs> it's some revisionist history. So I don't know. I like some of this guy's stuff on Twitter. I don't know a ton about him still. I've seen some good tweets he's made, but this was a bizarre <laughs> whole It was just a very thing. unique avenue to go down. Uh, yeah. Like, I don't can't say I hate it, but I certainly don't love it. <laughs> and he's very hit or miss for me. He also talked about um, defunding the FBI and replacing it with something much more limited. And yeah. I think I think that that's a great talking point. Um, but and he talked about uh, making constitutional carry the law of the land. And so we're picking out the more absurd moments. To be fair, there was a lot of good stuff that was pretty boilerplate. Um, but that is kind of the nature of highlighting an event that was hours and hours and hours. And that brings us to the most important speaker of the whole night and perhaps the most infuriating speaker of the whole night, because I feel gaslit by this man. And he has some audacity even showing his head, his face at an NRA convention. Um, but yet to then make the claims that he made that are so revisionist in history, that is former President Donald Trump. Take a listen. 2016, I promised you that I would save your Second Amendment from absolute obliteration. That's where it was going. And 
As your president, that's exactly what I did. We saved our Second Amendment, and we're going to save it for a long time to come. It's under siege, but we're going to save it for a long time to come, forever, as far as I'm concerned, forever. And thank you very much. So I was proud to be the most pro-gun, pro-Second Amendment president you've ever had in the White House. I think that's been acknowledged. And so, Hannah, I also just want to cue up a flashback video to when Trump was president. And after a mass shooting, there was discussion of different gun control policies. Here is what he had to say about gun control. After Vice President Mike Pence suggested court procedures for removing guns from dangerous people, Trump caught him and many in the room off guard by seeming to dismiss due process. I like taking the guns early. So you could do exactly what you're saying, but take the guns first, go through due process second. So we are now, we are now hearing the guy who said, take the guns first, do the due process later. So not just endorsing red flag laws, but saying like red flag laws without even due process on the front end, which they usually have, is now telling us he was the most pro Second Amendment president ever. Give me a break. I mean, he truly thinks his base is stupid. And if you believe this, you are stupid. He was actually the most anti Second Amendment president of my lifetime. I can't think of anybody in recent memory who's done more gun control at the federal level than Trump. And I have a real bone to pick about this because I famously did not get a job with NRA TV back in 2016 because I refused to say people should vote for Trump and because I refused to say that he was needed to protect the Second Amendment. And I staunchly disagreed with them even before he became president and did not get the job because of that. And I was right. Right. So I, uh, the fact that they continue to push him around again, it continues to prove my point. This is not a Second Amendment organization. I think they're frauds. I think that they uh, use the money that they raise very poorly. And you can look into all kinds of, of things behind the scenes when it comes to that. We won't get into it here. But it kind of makes me angry, the money that goes into this organization, because we do need to be fighting for the Second Amendment. It is under siege. But this organization is not doing what they're saying they're doing. They're wasting a lot of money and they're continuing to push people like Trump, who are enemies of our gun rights. Yeah, I mean, let's just roll back the tape for a minute here. The Trump administration tried to unilaterally ban bump stocks by having administrative agencies rewrite and reinterpret old laws, stretching them beyond all their meanings, and they were only thwarted by the courts from that major gun control effort that rivals anything the Biden administration has done, though they did sign a very modest piece of gun control legislation as well. Um, Trump tried to do gun control without legislation, and at different points during his presidency, he flip-flopped on many of these issues, but he uh, appeared to support uh, banning people who are 19 and 20-year-old adults from exercising their constitutional rights, raising the age to buy a gun to 21, even though the age of adulthood is 18, um, just flat out banning it. He at one point endorsed and then walked back. Uh, he also endorsed red flag laws, which, I mean, we've discussed – I think the way he described it is nuts, and to but there are, I think there are some narrow versions of them that you can make a, a debatable case for, and we've had this conversation. I'm not, I don't think I'm on board with them, but he wasn't even doing that. He took like the most extreme pro red flag anti due process position imaginable. He did all of this in public eye, and we have all the receipts. People were responding to this video saying that's a deep fake. It is not a deep fake. You are just have been misled or are forgetting important things from history. Um, he did this over and over and over again. He was not a particularly pro second amendment president at all. And he's simply pandering and gaslighting Republicans by trying to claim now that he was, um, it's just revisionist history and I, I won't stand for it. Hey guys, Brad here. I want to tell you about another podcast you might like since you're a fan of based politics. Undivided with Brandy Cruz, a Seattle-based podcast that looks to give a voice to Americans who can't stand either major political movement. The show is a mix of commentary on key issues and in-depth interviews that challenge mainstream narratives on topics like race, gender, and criminal justice. The host, Brandy Cruz, is a longtime TV journalist who quit corporate media out of frustration for how the press was covering political violence carried out by the left in 2020. Find out how you can watch or listen to Undivided by visiting undividedpod.com. That's undividedpod.com. A link will be in the show notes. 
Well, speaking of things I won't stand for, most people who listen to this show or follow me know that I spent a significant amount of time working against the death penalty in this country. I helped overturn it in three states, and I did that as somebody who was formerly very pro. When I first got involved with politics, I had sort of a knee-jerk reaction to the death penalty that one might expect a kid who grew up Republican and Southern Baptist to have. I thought I supported it, and then I started finding out how it actually operated, and like most people who have common sense do when they get in touch with the figures, I turned against it. So I'm really concerned about some recent news out of Florida. So according to reporting from Reuters, Florida Governor Ron DeSantis is expected to sign a bill allowing juries to recommend the death penalty in capital cases on an eight to four vote, a move spurred by the less than unanimous vote that led to the Parkland school shooter being sentenced to life in prison. The state's Republican-led House of Representatives approved the measure with an 80 to 30 vote following the Republican-controlled Senate's approval in March. The change only affects the penalty phase of capital trials. It would have no effect on the requirement for a jury's unanimous vote to convict a defendant. DeSantis has pushed for the legislation since October when he said he was, quote, quote, very disappointed after a jury could not come to unanimous decision on giving a dissonance to the Parkland shooter. Three jurors voted to spare him, and by default, his sentence was life in prison without the possibility of parole. If the bill becomes law, Florida would join Alabama as the only state where a unanimous jury decision is not required to give the death penalty. In 2017, Florida passed a law that required death penalties to be imposed only after a unanimous recommendation by a jury. That law came after the U.S. Supreme Court struck down an earlier state law saying it unconstitutionally let judges determine the facts that would lead to a death sentence rather than juries. So... Let me unpack this and break it down real fast. Brad, do you know how a death penalty trial is structured? Not really, but I think there's one about like, are you, is the person convicted? And then the second part is, all right, are we going to give them the death penalty or not? That's right. So when a prosecutor decides to seek the death penalty, they have to go through two phases. This is one reason that a death penalty case is so much more expensive than life in prison without parole. It's about a million dollars more than life in prison without parole, even if the jury does not give a death sentence. So that's one of the major issues I have with the death penalty is just the cost. Um, So this would basically say that you'd still have to go through that first phase and have a unanimous jury. But then once they said, yes, this person is guilty, the second phase, you would only have to have eight jurors vote to give the person the death penalty, which is still very significant in my book. Yes. So that's out of 12, right? Uh, 12 jurors? That's out of 12. And just a couple things for you to note. Um, in 1972, the Supreme Court actually banned non-unanimous jury verdicts. So there's a reason that they cannot make the uh, the actual guilt or innocence phase non-unanimous because it's already been ruled unconstitutional. And the reason that the Supreme Court had to do that is that once it was um, allowed or, or mandated, rather, that Black people be allowed on jurors, um, we started seeing states do this in some capacities, especially across the South, where they wanted to water down the presence of Black people on juries. And so they started pushing for um, verdicts that would allow like 10-2 decisions. Uh, we actually just saw Louisiana get rid of that kind of law back in 2018. So this not only is an obviously very bad idea, but it does have significant ties to systemically racist notions of the past. Well, let me so ask I'm you just... about that because I'll give the Florida Republicans the benefit of the doubt. I don't think they're doing it to water down intentionally not to, to water down black presence on juries, if though that's the history. But I, I, I will say this, if the Supreme Court has ruled it unconstitutional in the past to have a non-unanimous vote to convict somebody, why would they not expect this to potentially be challenged and struck down? If you can't do it for the, the actual court decision, why would you be able to do it for the punishment? Yeah, well, I mean, because that hasn't been ruled on yet. So I think you could expect to see challenges to this. But like I mentioned, there's been a lot of legal limbo with Florida's death penalty system since 2017. um, Because up until then, they were basically allowing judges, I believe, to override juries in this phase. And so the Supreme Court struck that down. um, And they had to pass a law saying there were non-unanimous juries um, for this phase. And now they're trying to basically go back and take another. So it's kind of a tug of war that you're seeing in Florida right now. Um, but across the board, this is just a very bad idea. And whether or not, you know, the people in the Republican legislature, Ron DeSantis, are sitting here thinking, let's go after black people. No, I, I don't think that that's true. Um, but I do think that non-unanimous juries have that history. And I think that to this day, there's a real reason that they want to water down the presence of different people on juries. They want to be able to, you know, kind of puppeteer the outcomes. And I think that you, the fact that you have a governor running around saying this one case, this one jury in this one case didn't give the verdict that 
I think they should have given. So I want to redo how we do this this phase for all other cases is absurd. A jury is uh, is a totally different body than a governor. And I think they have an important presence. And, and you should have to get a unanimous jury. And you should have to have a diverse jury and actually have a jury of your, of your peers. And when you see politicians seeking to either make juries one-dimensional or prohibit their authority when they are not one-dimensional, I think you have a really serious issue that undercuts yeah. the... I'm always, um, I'm always very hesitant to second guess a jury because, and you see a lot of this in like in discussion of controversial court cases. I'm not saying I'll never second guess a jury, but oftentimes I will definitely give the jury the benefit of the doubt if they reach a unanimous conclusion because they have access to information we don't have and they have to follow the rules of evidence. So sometimes we have misleading evidence that's not allowed in court, but we're using that to influence our decisions in public, in the court of public opinion. So I'm never one to really second guess a jury without very good cause, but I do understand the emotion behind wanting the Parkland shooter to get the death penalty completely. But I think it's fair to expect our policymakers to not let an emotional response to one incident allow them to rewrite policies in a bad way. Mm -hmm. And I don't know all of the reasons why they couldn't get to unanimous jury in this one case, but I will say when it comes to the death penalty, um, the death penalty was banned in 1973 in the U.S., and it was banned for about three, a little over three years in this country because of how it was being applied. It was so arbitrary, um, so biased that the Supreme Court said at that time it was as random as being struck by lightning, and therefore they said it violated the Eighth Amendment's prohibitions against cruel and unusual punishment. So it's not that they thought it was cruel. They found that it was so unusual in nature that it violated the Eighth Amendment. And so the states couldn't carry it out for a period of time. They had to come in and add a lot of factors um, known as aggravating factors, mitigating factors to try to make it more fair and more evenly applied. And so when you have a jury, they have to consider things under those statutes. Um, and so when it comes to mitigating evidence, we don't know what all they saw. We weren't in the jury pool. But, you know, you could have things like somebody's mental health, like their IQ status. These are things that have to be considered. And whatever it is that this jury saw, a significant number of them were not convinced that this was somebody who should be put to death. And I you know, I think there are other problems with the death penalty we'll get into in just a second. But I think that that's something that should be respected, because even as it stands, um, even given all these, you know, stipulations states had to put in place to bring the death penalty back, we have a system that is still absolutely overrun with innocence issues. The stats are astounding. And they get worse every year because we keep finding more and more innocence issues in the system as technology develops, as I think true crime has really developed as a genre. People are going back and combing through old cases more and more. When I first started this work, it was one person had been exonerated for every 10 executions in the country. Uh, that was in 2018. Now that stat is one person has been exonerated for every eight executions in this country. And there's no telling how many wow. more people are innocent on death row as we speak because those exonerations are not because the system going through and working and methodically checking itself and finding issues of innocence and promptly letting these people go. No, this is mostly charity work being done by groups like the Innocence Project. This is pro bono work. And they simply don't have enough people to go back over all the cases. So it's kind of a crapshoot. And even when they do get solid evidence that somebody very well might be innocent, such as new DNA or things of that nature, the, the lift to get it back through the court system and to actually get a judge to re-examine it is significant. So it's a very pressing issue. And those stats are bad enough, but Florida is actually even worse. Um, they are the number one state in the country for people exonerated. They've had 30 people exonerated thus far since 1973. Uh, their stats are for every three people they've executed, one has been exonerated. And three-fourths, so 75% of those exonerations discovered thus far are people of color. So, Oh, good. Sounds yeah. exactly like a system we should be expanding. For sure. They're nailing it in Florida. They just got it all figured out. Might as well speed it up. No, this is moronic. Um, on top of that, they spend a million dollars per week in Florida to have their death penalty system. That's insanity. That's insanity. $51 million a year. Uh, they have 14,000 unsolved homicides that have accumulated in the 30 years since they resumed execution. So not doing so great on the whole prevention uh, or even solving of homicides outside the death penalty system. Uh, they are the number two when it comes to uh, death row populations in, in the whole U.S. They have 333 people on their death row. So this state 
is a problem. It's a menace, honestly. And I would be terrified for my civil liberties if I lived in this state. I mean, it's, it's actually atrocious what's happening there. So the thought that they are so arrogant, they think they should speed it up. The fact that anybody who claims to believe in limited government and individual liberty could look at these very basic stats and think this is a good idea blows my mind. Yeah, I, I agree with you. Uh, I think it's a mistake. I, I'm a little bit optimistic. Maybe it'll get challenged in the courts and struck down. But I do, I do think it's a mistake. Yeah, we'll see. Like I mentioned, Alabama actually does have something similar. So they'll be one of only two states. And these do happen to be two of the worst when it comes to uh, actually executing the wrong people. And also just when it comes to the racial bias that you see within their system. So it's a huge problem. But, you know, aside from innocence issues in the death penalty, and I'm not going to we don't have time to go all the way into this today, but I really implore people don't be emotional about this. Don't have a knee jerk reaction because I promise you this is the tip of the iceberg when it comes to issues. I have one of my original episodes of Based where I dug into all of the data. We'll link in the show notes. You can go back and watch it. But there, there's many problems. As I mentioned, it's not a deterrent. As I mentioned, it's vastly more expensive to have the death penalty than it is life in prison without parole. So it's not cutting down on costs. And that's not because it takes too long to execute people. That's a common misperception. That is because of the trial. Like I said, before. It is about a million dollars more just to have a death penalty trial. Um, as the like 1990s ended, most states had implemented life in prison without parole. And at that point, we started seeing juries deciding to send people to death row um, really, really drop because most people who are on a jury pool don't want to have to make that decision. They recognize they could still be wrong. They know there's a way to ensure that society is protected without the, the death penalty. And so most of the time when you're pursuing it, you're spending a million dollars for nothing because juries are still going to say no, which is, I think, one reason Florida is probably trying to, to do this, that so they can get more yeses for their money. Um, on, aside from that, there is still a lot of arbitrariness when it comes to the death penalty. It has nothing to do with the nature of the crime that's committed. That's one of the main pushbacks I hear is people are like, don't you think we should kill child murderers or child molesters? And I'm like, that's actually not even eligible for the death penalty right now, number one. But two, uh, even if it were, that's not how the death penalty is allocated. They don't go and look for the worst, the worst cases and assign the death penalty to that. It actually comes down to the location where the crime was committed. The majority of death penalty cases come from only 2% of counties in the, in the whole country. Uh, and then it comes down to the race of the victim. It's mostly pursued against uh, people who have killed white people. And then it comes down to the socioeconomic socioeconomic status of the defendant. If you can hire an attorney, you probably aren't going to get the death penalty, but most of these people are indigent and uh, don't have very good representation. So again, go and look into some of these things. I've covered it much more in depth, but I think it's a huge issue. And I, I'm really disgusted to see Republicans who, again, still continue to run around and claim to be for limited government and individual liberty pushing this kind of thing. If you think the government's corrupt, if you think it's prone to error, then you should not be wanting to give it the power over life and death. And you sure, certainly shouldn't be wanting to expedite these kinds of methods. Yeah, no. Um, but we, uh, we've got to move on and, and talk about our quick hits segment. So the first thing in our quick hits segment is what I would call a homophobic Karen who melted down in a Lego store. Now, this video was widely shared by people on the right, including the likes of Charlie Kirk, who some of whom seem to think the, the man in this video, uh, it's a man uh, berating several employees of a Lego store, think he's the good guy. But I watched it and I had the opposite conclusion. So take a listen uh, and we'll get your thoughts, Hannah. The Lego group supports what? Yeah, the Lego group profile supports the LGBTQ community. Do we want? Yeah. yeah. Yes. But the question is, why are you all in here with those pins on? Do you think children care about what man sucks at home and but what it, girl eats vaginas it's at home? Lead, man. Do you think they care about it's that? It's time to leave, man. Do, I mean, do, do you think they care? I don't think they think about that personally. Right. They so why would so, 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 they, they think about it when they see your pen? No, they don't. It's it's leave. Yes, they do. It's, it's disgusting. Guys, call That's called okay. grooming. All right. Is y'all my leave? Yeah. If you call security, tell security that you're, that you're in here you wearing a uh, pride flag on, you your, on your shirt. Come on, guys. It's time to leave. Well, you know what's amazing? Most children don't know. He's been educated by me. I think it's grooming. It's, it's borderline pedophilia and child abuse for these weirdos to come in here and wear that and at the same time kids buy from the store. When does sir, it stop? Sir, I'm sick and tired. Don't have to shop. Huh? Yeah, but I came in here to buy something. When does it stop? At some point, we need to stop pushing this mess on children. At this point, we're just going to have to ask you to leave. I'll leave. Okay. And I won't spend any money 
at Lego. If you're in here right now, if you're in here right now and you care about value, this store is intentionally promoting LGBTQ behavior on children. Spend your money in a place that doesn't do that to kids. Sir, you're about to get trespassed. Thank you. So let me for, paint the picture for you guys who are just listening to us. It's all over tiny little tiny pins these guys have on their aprons that are the rainbow flag. And I, this guy, I think, I think this is deranged behavior. <laughs> I like how all the other clients in the store are standing around like, sir, this is a Wendy's. Like, what in the world? <laughs> <laughs> no, the pins are literally so small that I know I should wear glasses and I just don't, but I can't see them. So I feel like he went in here looking for a fight. This is somebody who just, I, I don't think this is even a normal situation. This didn't happen organically. I don't, he was looking for his viral moment or something. This is. He got it. It's got 6 million views. Congrats. There's your legacy. Your 15 minutes of fame. You deranged little Karen. I just, I don't have the energy. I, I, I continue to just really feel there's this chasm between people like me who have happy, fulfilling, normal lives and who are still bothered by true injustices and spend time trying to rectify those in the world. And then people like this, where I'm like, what has gone so wrong in your life where you were yelling at a minimum wage Lego employee over a difference in the, their support for LGBTQ people? Like, I, I cannot. Not, he, can't, he, yelled, he literally yelled about pedophilia. It's like, I'm. I'm. First off, sir, you're the one screaming vulgar sexual things in a store full of children. You're screaming about genitalia and fellatio in a store full of children at the top of your lungs, and yet they're the ones who are being inappropriate towards kids by wearing a tiny little pin. That the and I, you see a lot of this because. There are some real examples of pushing inappropriate sexual content on children um, in association with kind of LGBT. That are, there are real examples of that. But a tiny rainbow pin, there's nothing in here. First off, most kids aren't going to notice this. Uh, it's, it's really their way of signaling support for staff and et cetera. Um, but also, there's nothing inherently sexual about it. And any more than a Disney movie that depicts a prince and a princess is sexualized it's you can depict you you can discuss a concept of romance without it being exposing kids to sex which is what he's accusing them of but in fact he's the one doing that and he's just going full karen and melting down on these random minimum wage employees and making a jackass out of himself over it yeah, I just think these people as a whole are a menace to society. And if it wasn't LGBTQ, they'd be finding something else to complain about because I think it's the only way they're ever seen or heard, period. And they, I don't know, I think we should offer a service for people like this where you pay monthly to talk to somebody on the other end just because I think these are lonely, like people devoid of normal human interaction. And, and they probably need that when pay for that kind of service. I think that's a genius idea. Anyways, we have to move on. Let's move to this clip of Bernie, Bernie Sanders, getting into it with Jen Psaki over making everything about capital. Capitalism. The title of your book, It's Okay to Be Angry About Capitalism, really did sit with me. It is a memorable book title, Senator. Of all the things voters are angry about, and there are many, abortion, the lack of progress on gun reform, even Clarence Thomas's questionable relationship with a billionaire. I know how you feel about billionaires. Why should capitalism be at the top of that list? Why was that important to be in the title of that book? Jen, what's important, abortion is a huge issue. Social justice is a huge issue. But, you know, sometimes the corporate media forgets about it and Congress forgets about it. You and I are chatting today. Do you know that there are tens and tens of millions of Americans who cannot afford health care, who are scared to death that if their kid or their parent gets sick, they don't know what's going to happen? There are people working for starvation wages. There are moms who can't afford to send their kids to decent childcare, can't even find a slot. Those are in issues of enormous consequence we don't talk about. Now you tell me, you got three people on top today who own more wealth than the bottom half of American society. Is that an issue we should be talking about? Does that sound like we have an economy that works for all of us or just the few? Is that an issue worth discussing? We're talking about it now, Senator, so I'm happy to have you on. I wanted to yeah, ask you about President... Uh, I did want to ask you, sir, about President Biden's nomination of Julie Sue for the Labor Department Secretary. Right, but I wanted to talk, and I love Julie. I love Julie. We're going to do our best to go. But let's talk about income and wealth inequality. 
Let's talk about concentration of ownership. Let's talk about corporate ownership of the media. Do you think that those are issues worth discussing? Well, Senator, I have you on today. We're having a conversation about all of these issues. I did want to ask you about this because okay. you are chairman of this committee. It is important to have a labor I secretary am. in place, right? Uh, there is reporting it that sure suggests is. the holdouts are Senator Manchin and Senator Sinema. First of all, is that true? And second, what are you saying to them to get them on board? What's the case you're making for her? Well, look, we have Manchin and Sinema who torpedoed build, uh, build Back America. You are slightly familiar with that issue, I think. So my favorite part about this is that Bernie goes off on this huge rant about the reasons we need to talk about capitalism. It's actually just this huge list of all the things government has broken. And he's been in government for the past like 250 years. I don't know how old he is. He's old. He's been there forever. And he lists all these industries that have been completely broken by government intervention into the market, which is his sole purpose in life is for more government intervention into the market. And I just, the uh, total disconnect in this man's logic and his understanding of how things work. It is astounding. I'd blame dementia, but he's been like this as far back as I can remember. Yeah. He doesn't have the Biden excuse. No, it, it is there's the surface level funny of this, which is uh, we need to be angry about capitalism and that's why you need to buy my book on Amazon now. Um, but then there's the deeper level of irony to this that most of the things he cites here, all of the things he cites are not examples of unbridled capitalism. For example, healthcare is a deeply, it's not really a market, most of it, uh, uh, portions of it are, most of it's government healthcare at this point. The rest is highly regulated and subsidized. It's nothing close to a free market. And the few niche areas within healthcare that are free markets, for example, LASIK eye surgery services, um, are, have actually become radically more affordable over time as the technology advances through innovation and then people have there's competition to get the prices lower. Uh, but then the broken, bloated mess that we have for our healthcare system is not capitalist at all, really. Uh, and then same with, he talks about wages not going so far and people having starvation wages. Well, maybe that's because they don't have education opportunity. They're being failed by a government monopoly on education in most parts of the country. And two, their paychecks are worth a heck of a lot less than they were because of runaway inflation from your massive big government policies. So the whole thing in childcare too, it's a little more complicated. I don't know that much about that, but I know like places where I've lived in the past required college degrees to be a childcare worker. The government required that. Like they have all these ways they make it more expensive as well. So it's also not unbridled capitalism, but the whole thing, uh, it's just, it's like old man yells at cloud. He wants to make everything about his, his communist issues. He's so upset about the idea that some people have more money than others which is not even inherent. There's nothing inherently wrong with it, but some of it's due to corruption, like crony capitalism and then rigging the system for the elite. And he has some right to be mad about that. But most people's problems today are not because Jeff Bezos has a lot of money. Like that is not why people have problems. Uh, it, it's much more to do with things in their own lives and ways they're being held back, the way their paycheck's been eroded by inflation and confiscated through taxation and the housing market made too expensive by government failure after government failure. It's like, it's not because Jeff Bezos is rich because he built an amazing company that services Americans every single day uh, with wonders that people couldn't have imagined just a few decades ago. It's like, he's just obsessed with class envy and class warfare is what I'm getting from this. Yeah. And I think as a whole, the whole grift of getting rich off of blaming capitalism in this country continues to be lucrative for people. But it's really one of the main reasons I launched BASE initially. I really did want people to learn how to think and how to find the root problems of issues because I think people like Bernie Sanders are really good at saying, there's a problem here. This is wrong. This is broken. But they're really bad at coming up with solutions. And if you don't understand what causes the problems, you're going to be misled by, by absolute hacks like this, right? And you're going to be hoodwinked into supporting the very thing that created the problem in the first place. And that's my, my main issue with Bernie is that he gets the, the actual problems correct, but his solution is the same things that broke the system in the first place. And he continues to get richer while you get poorer because he's found a grift on all of this. So that's why I have no love lost on this old man.
No, and it is funny how in, uh, over the course of this interview, I watched the full thing, not just the clip we showed you. Uh, he gets very angry with Jen Psaki. And then it's like, he, it's like when you've lost MSNBC, right? When you're mad at MSNBC for not being progressive enough. Now, they are on like foreign policy and stuff. They're pretty establishment and war hockey. But like generally, they're pretty progressive. And he's like, can't stand how corporate they are. Now <laughs> they're not mad enough about capitalism. And it's like, dude. <sighs> Yikes. All right, Hannah. Now we need to talk about a so-called red pill YouTuber, Pearl Davis, known as Just Pearly Things on YouTube, who made a video responding to a video we made about some of her content. So a while back, we responded to some of her pretty wild takes. Uh, she's very anti-feminist, frankly, anti-woman on many things. Uh, I believe she's against even women having the right to vote. I'm not 100% sure, but I think she is. Uh, she's been made some controversy lately, palling around with virulent racists like Nick Fuentes and hosting them on her show. But she decided to respond to our video, and it included a couple pretty funny moments where she said things about us that don't make a whole lot of sense if you know us. Um, but uh, are you excited to hear from Miss Pearl again, Hannah? I guess so. She's kind of hard to not hear from. She spends her day screeching online, whining about women and basically appealing to incels and the alt-right. So uh, I first came across Pearl because she started coming to my boyfriend's algorithm, which made me question his algorithm for a minute. She started <laughs> sending me the video being like, what is wrong with this girl? And that's been the main way I've seen her is actually from high quality men who are high income earners, respectable men sending me her videos and be like, there's something really wrong with this. Um, but I think that tells you something about what's going on online. And I do want to talk about this really fast because my TikTok algorithm does something that's opposite. Like she doesn't show up in my TikTok algorithm, but I get a lot of anti-man content. And I have a theory that I think our algorithm is trying to turn the genders against one another. And she, you know, contributes to it. She's basically a female version of Andrew Tate. I think that I can at least have some sympathy, though I, you know, come hard for Andrew Tate, but he's he said some things about his childhood that let you know, like this is a broken little boy inside. Pearl, I just think, is somebody who has decided she can make a quick buck by throwing her own sex under the bus. And I think she's somebody who genuinely seems to hate other women, which I don't get, I really like other women. I'm pro other women. I like supporting other women. So I just think that she's a really seedy commentator, but I do think it's important to debunk much of what she says, which is why we responded the first time. I haven't watched her response to our response because I was busy doing actual life. Well, I have. Don't so worry. Let's see what uh, she's got. Yeah. So first up, she's really obsessed with body count. And we criticized her last time because the amount of people somebody slept with. Um, and we criticized her last time for describing women as ran through mm -hmm. and basically saying if they've had a lot of partners in the past, they're not valuable as a partner now to anyone. And they're basically like um, just not worthy. Uh, I mean, she really comes down very hard against people with high body counts, but then she says it's fine for a man. doesn't matter. So she, uh, here's her attempt to respond to that about us. Take a listen. You ever notice, guys, guys, I, I hate to do this. King, king. You ever notice whenever guys say things like that, they always have like a female like bass in their voice. It's like, I don't know how to describe it. It's like, there's like a, I don't know. Much. Um, I just, when Logan sent me, I said, this might be the most pick me girl energy I've ever come across in my life. Like I didn't know who she was at all, but I was like, this girl desperately wants mm. men to like her. Um, I thought it was really just absurd across the board. I mean, yeah, first and foremost, just to like, so demeaning towards women to say they're- Do you ever notice how, like they, they're not talking about anything I said that was untrue. It's always, oh, she's a pick me. She just wants men to like her. And that's, you know, they don't have a good argument. Nothing I said was untrue and through and like uh that that somehow like hurts their value if they've had sex with multiple people as if men no, she also... would never say that about a man who's no. who's had sex with lots of people i would say that about a man that has sex with a dude i would or has kissed a dude i won't name names i won't name names <laughs> but but seriously like i think that's the equivalent is um uh a, a girl that slept with a hundred dudes is not as valuable to the marketplace there's not a high demand for women that have slept with a lot of dudes um the same way there's not a high demand from women for men that have slept with other dudes so I love how we accuse her of having a double standard and then she responds and she's like yeah I do have a double standard also, I don't like bisexual men. They're gross. <laughs> also, we did debunk what she was saying, and I'll continue to, which is that, you know, I will say this. I've never not gotten a single man I wanted. 
And I tend to date pretty high income earning men. I tend to date men who are pretty successful in their lives and pretty good looking. And I can tell you this, not a single one has ever given two craps about how many men I've slept with. Um, I really do think this is a bizarre thing. Like my only, the only thing that makes this make sense is like, are you a virgin? And that's your only thing that you think you bring to the table. So you're really trying to like uplift yourself and put other people down who've had more sexual partners. Cause as a whole, just biologically, people who've had more sexual partners are usually the more attractive, desirable people because they simply can. So I, I truly don't understand her logic on this. There's nothing that makes what she says true other than her incel audience backing her up on it. And it's I also promise hard you. Because like she's she's acting like people have their body count tattooed on their forehead. Yeah. As if it's like known information that the market is dealing with. Like it's actually not. Like if I'm dating, nobody knows how many partners I've had. And if they ask, I don't have to tell them, or I also don't have to tell them the truth. Most people don't tell them the truth. Um I do think that promiscuity in general is not great for people. Uh, and no. I don't know. But also, if somebody had that in their past and that's not where they're at now, I, w I would accept that. I mean, people can change. Why do you want to condemn people forever over things the way they were in the past? We all were young once. We all grow up. We all evolve. We change. Um, and, and also, it's just, again, why are you obsessed with this? Because because her audience is made up of people who can't get any. Like, I really think that's what it comes down to. It's made up of men who, like, really want women that they cannot obtain. And so because they can't obtain them, they want to see somebody else slander them and go after them and demean them and tell them all the things that they can't say to them themselves because they can't even get around the women they want to sleep with. So Pearl saying it for them, they're like, yeah, get them. But they, they're being pawned by her because, as a whole, people like me, who she's trying to tear down, don't give a crap what people like her or the men in her audience think, right? Like we wouldn't give them the time of day. Most people who've become successful women, most women who, you know, are able to date around and have lots of, of male partners and travel the world and do all these things she wants to condemn women for, they're not bothered by what somebody like Pearl has to say about them. That's why they're successful. And they're not bothered by what these seedy men online in their mom's basements are writing in their comment sections. So as a whole, like, I just think if you, if you're one of these people who find yourself in the audience of people like Pearl or Andrew Tate, you're making them wealthy, but they're playing you. They're not actually hurting the people that you think they're hurting. They're actually just trapping you in your own loser mentality. And if you don't get out of it, you're never going to fix your life. No, I, I agree. A lot of people hate watch. Like I hate watch Andrew Tate sometimes. And I will say, I mean, I get it. We're enabling him and we're promoting him. But it is like, it's kind of like a train wreck. You can't look away sometimes. Well, and it's kind of like you said earlier with Michael Knowles. I mean, these people already platform. They have large audiences. And I don't think that they're harmless when it comes to people like Pearl or Andrew Tate. I think they're speaking to angry young men who don't have an outlet, who feel powerless, who are being told, your problem is women. Your problem is women. This is why you need to be angry at them. And that, you know, can lead to actual violence against women down the road. So it's not that we're platforming them. I think it's really important to denounce what they're saying. And there can be elements of truth, right? I think that's what makes this really um, kind of dangerous is that, like you said, promiscuity is not a great idea. It's not great for your health. It's not great for your mental health. It's not something that you want to be encouraging. But that being said, is it the end of the world if you've had five plus sexual partners? No. I mean, most people don't get married till they're 30 something now. That's not even one per year. So to act like this is something that makes somebody, you know, worthless or totally ran through, ran through. It's like, uh, this is actually just sort of a normal dating spectrum for most people these days. All right, let's go to the second clip that we have of her here where she makes a rather funny insinuation. Your past matters. Um, for men, your future matters more. For women, your past matters more. And, you know, we can try to fight it all we want, but it is what it is. And I, I think it's more honest to women to say, you know what, if you make these choices, these are going to be the consequences rather than just lying. And that's what I hate about these type of conversations. Like what, she looks like she's like in her... Uh, late, late twenties, early thirties. So, you know, um, and, uh, I don't, I don't know. And he's just pandering to her, you know, he probably wants to sleep with her or whatever. And, um, the issue is that, you know, instead of admitting that, you know, her mistakes maybe have had some consequences, she's going to say they don't matter and shame people for telling the truth about the way society is where, you know, if you were honest, maybe the younger women could make better decisions. <sighs> And this is this is the this is just my issue. I just can't stand 
average chicks shitting on average men. You're an average chick. Why are you shitting on average men? So this is my problem with her is that she's trying to say, oh, your decisions led you to somewhere you don't want to be and you should let younger women know. No, I'm so happy with every decision I've made. I could have gotten married when I was 25 to my college boyfriend who was lovely, wonderful person. Didn't want to. I'm now very successful, very wealthy, have a career I love, have you know, everything I've ever wanted in life and still have the whole world open to me. I want other women to feel empowered. And if, that, if you want to get married young, that's fine. But I also think it's fine to wait. And I hate more than anything when people try to put women in boxes and say, you must confine yourself to these stereotypes. You must make these decisions. You must pick one pathway in order to be happy in life. I always rejected that. I remember people telling me, you got to have kids. And I was like, I don't want to have kids. I know this about myself. I don't want to. I don't want to be married young. I know that. Um, and so I want other women to know like it's fine. And I, you know, as I said, I've had no issue in relationships. I I continue to get any man that I want to uh, be with. And I, and I think that the high quality men out there do not think like she's telling you that they do. I think it's men who want to control women who think like that. I think it's men who want to break women down, who see women who are out of their league and want them to lower their standards to be with them, that try to push this narrative on people of you better just hurry up and accept whatever scraps you can get from a man or you'll end up alone and with cats. These kinds of threats aren't working against women anymore, largely because we have people like me who are in my 30s, I'm 35, by the way, and who have made different life choices. And women can look at them and see that there's not, you know, a one dimensional life available to them and that you're not going to end up terrified and alone and ugly and sad with cats. And cats are great if you do. Um, no, they're so I, not. Cats, no, dogs. I like cats. Cats are, dogs are better, but I do like cats. But my point just being like, I hate this fear mongering. And one of the top DMs I get from women, and it makes me really sad are women who are just saying, I wish I'd known I could be like you when I was younger. I love my kids, Aww. but I kind of regret having kids. I love my husband, but I regret that I never went after the career. I'm gonna cry, like I feel very sorry for them. They feel very trapped and they feel like they were lied to when they were younger. They were pushed into lifestyles by people older than them. And they didn't know that you could you know, pick these alternate pathways. And I think that that ultimately does lead to divorce. I think that leads to people not being as present as mothers when they aren't fulfilled themselves. I think it has all kinds of actual societal consequences. So I am a voice for women and saying you can you can have a traditional lifestyle and that's great. I know many women who've done it and who are happy, but you don't have to. And if that's not what you want to do, don't feel boxed into that. I agree with you, but I think I'm only agreeing with you because I want to sleep with you apparently. That's true. <laughs> definitely do. I'm I'm exactly she really got hit the bullseye with that. I mean, <laughs> it just doesn't speak well of Pearl that she's putting this on her YouTube channel, 1.4 million subscribers, and she doesn't do like basic research into who she's looking at or talking about on her show. Like that's kind of crazy to me because obviously I'm gay. Uh, I have uh, Hannah, it, and I do not have that kind of relationship. Although I think <laughs> her mom at one point thought we were. Uh, mom definitely gay, thought so, <laughs> which is hilarious on so many levels. Um, but uh, that was really funny. I also, so not in the clip we just played elsewhere in the video, I didn't pull it out. Uh, she, so she called you an, a average woman and then elsewhere she calls you out for your Botox and lip fillers. And mm -hmm. I'll let you respond to that. But first I'll just say this. I don't want to go ad hominem, but I'll just say, Pearl, you maybe don't want to play the bashing looks game. Maybe you maybe don't want to go there. You know, I was always taught that you shouldn't take criticism from someone you wouldn't take advice from. So when it comes to looks, I don't really care what Pearl has to say. Uh, but I do have Botox and filler. I'm very open about it because, again, I'm pro woman and I want women to know that, you know, I get work done. And if you, you know, look at me and see a Photoshopped image or something, like there is stuff that goes into that. I can't stand when celebrities lie about it. I think that's actually kind of detrimental to people mentally. It's not all that expensive to get Botox or filler anymore. So some people might want to consider it. Free market, um, baby. Yeah. But I mean, when you call me average, that's hilarious because I'm like well above average. I make so much more money than the average man. I own my own business. I have traveled the world. Like I don't I don't think I'm average, sweetie. Um, but I don't know. Again, like to me, I just think Pearl's a deeply unhappy person. I don't think this is somebody who, you don't spend your days online doing this if you're well rounded. Um, I, you know, I'm sorry for ever hurt her, 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 her or whatever's made her hate women so much, but I will try my best to counter that nonsense with with actual pro woman content because this is not it. And again, if you're a man and you find yourself in her audience, and you're going to come to our video to give us hate because you're following her and you really like what she has to say. You're getting suckered 
you're absolutely getting suckered. Women are not listening to her. Again, only men who are failing in life are listening. The comments to her. is ninety five percent men. Yeah, uh, and not again, like not men who are thriving. <laughs> you know, I mean that, that's the funny thing about this is that all these guys are like high value men don't want this. I'm like high value men are not on these channels. They're not in these. I, mean, I don't think high value men typically describe themselves as high high value men. It's like when they tell you they're an alpha male, and I'm like. Real alpha males don't need to go around bragging about how alpha they are. It kind of speaks for themselves. That's exactly it. I agree with you. High value men don't describe themselves like this. They don't hang out in these comment sections. But I think if there is justice in the world, Pearl will get with one of these guys and her audience since this is so desperately what she's after. And I hope that she keeps all of them to herself because we don't want them. The rest of the rest of the female population is real good. Yeah. Um, let's run through a few comments from her comment section that I thought were funny. She, DJ Tech Boom said, that girl couldn't even find a straight guy to agree with her. She had to get one of her gay boy friends. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> like, we do host a podcast together. Um, so I don't know. The next comment says, I don't know if it's their lighting or the cameras they are using, but both their facial expressions make them look like NPC characters you see in Sims or something. <laughs> <laughs> I think also our, our our audio and video tech setup has improved since then. We got a great uh, so it wasn't amazing, team. but uh, let's see. Shoal Nervo says none of these people have real profile pics. She looks like she's in her mid sixties and late twenties at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> And okay. Eric said, I can't tell which one is wearing the most makeup. Definitely Brad. <laughs> just yeah, that's just funny to me because I don't wear makeup don't. during these shows. I've considered actually starting, but I do not as a fact wear makeup when we record these shows from home. Like, so I don't know, bro. You you played yourself. All yeah, right. You're just really attractive without it. Uh, yeah, I guess. Uh, that's all the time we have for Miss Pearl, Miss Thing. Um, she's going to be over there getting mad and h- hating on women, and that's fine. We probably won't pay much attention to her in the future unless there's something particularly egregious. But we wanted to react to that, um, especially the revelation that I've been just doing a long con to get with Hannah, uh, my boyfriend okay. of three years. It's, it's, just a, it's just a hoax. Like like in <laughs> sitcoms, when somebody comes, like one of the guys comes out as gay to like get in the dressing room with the women or whatever. <laughs> yeah, that's, it's a super long con to get to that. So let us know what you guys think. Uh, if you're Team Pearl or Team Hannah, um, maybe we can even get them in the same room for a debate at some day. That would be quite something. Uh, no but we're going to move on and head to our um, mailbag. All right. So I got a piece of mail I wanted to respond to this week, actually via a DM. So it's a little bit longer, but I thought this was a really great question. So I wanted to respond to it here. Uh, and this is from Duncan. And he said, hey, I wasn't sure how to address this, but I'm a little confused. Why does the Supreme Court so often rule on precedent? Why is it viewed that the first time a case of its type comes to the court, future judgment should be made based off that past decision, regardless of how long ago it was made and how much of the circumstances in our world have changed? Love the podcast. Keep up the good work. So I wanted to respond to this because this is something that I think a lot of people really aren't aware about in our legal system. And there's not necessarily a reason why other than that's kind of been the prevailing legal theory, if you will, that's been baked into our system for some time. And so oftentimes you don't see that like the Constitution mandates that they go back and review decisions and and basically give that what's called precedent the next time they're determining a similar issue. But it's something that judges over time have decided is a good way of evaluating the law. And it's sort of been baked into our system and how we evaluate things. Some of that is to to expedite matters so that they can sort of look back and say, what have other judges thought about this similar issue? How have they, you know, have they used logic and the law to reason through it? Um, And they don't always have to defer to it, right? So oftentimes you will see cases get overturned and that sets a new precedent. Um, But that is basically what you're trying to do as a whole. So if you're trying to, um, within our community, for example, uh, if we were trying to get rid of the death penalty via legal statute, which was a strategy, I did more of the legislative angle, but some people wanted to get the courts to overturn it again, you would try to get new precedent. So you would challenge, you would find cases that would specifically challenge old um, cases that set precedent precedent and try to take them out. So think of it like bullying. Basically, you're trying to take out the old um, prevailing notions that have been established. So I don't really have a deeper reason, Brad, if you want to add to that. But that's, think, that's yeah, the, the one that. reason you didn't mention is uh, stability and predictability and consistency. So there's a debate within the legal circles over how much should you defer to precedent. 
But the people who are the most dedicated to following precedent, somebody like a Chief Justice John Roberts, what they would argue, and I think there's some truth to it, but I'm a little more radical than them and that I really bad precedents I think should just be gotten away with. But um, is that if the courts were changing the law every few years, it would be very inconsistent, very unfair very unstable, and it would erode the legitimacy of the courts. So for example, like if the Supreme Court made a, uh, had made its, its Heller ruling, establishing a Second Amendment right to, to firearms, and then two years later, when one judge changed, reversed the whole thing, and then two years later, reversed that, um, that would be chaos. It would be totally unworkable. It would be disruptive. It would be unfair to people affected by the laws. And it would really erode the legitimacy of the Supreme Court in the eyes of the public. So that's why I, I am okay with overturning precedent, but not willy nilly, not all the time. Like you do have to have some degree of deference to precedent, especially if it's really recent, um, because otherwise it, it would kind of all fall apart. That, that's my best understanding of it. Yeah, I think that's really that's really important to know. And guys, just if you want to link into it more, it's called stare decisis. That is that's the name of the way people would look at this. That's a, a legal theory. You also can see things like originalism. That would be a legal theory that says judges should pay more attention to the original context of the Constitution. You have some progressivism, progressive activism, judicial activism sort of camps that would say you should be you know finding ways to move your agenda through the courts. So stare decisis is merely a, a way of determining how you want to interpret the law, but it is very popular and I think does have some importance. All right, All right, let's move on. Yeah, next up, we've got a comment from Nathan who says, two of the hottest political commentators on air. I mean it both ways. Ooh. Thank you, and we love a bisexual king. No, I have no idea. <laughs> I have no idea, but just think it's funny. I think he means like we're physically hot, but mentally hot. Yeah, like you, your weird conflation of yeah. hotness and basedness. Yeah. Uh, it is. But all right. All right. Gabriella says, preach, Hannah. What was she telling me to preach about? I have no idea. <laughs> I will, though. Preacher's daughter. <laughs> uh, this next one says, I prefer rational discussion and commenting on the girl's message over pushing the concept of taking medication or calling someone a bad person. It's about the message and the mania is fed by the indulgence of the entitlement. That's about our response to that crazy TikTok girl. All right. When I said take meds, I was kind of joking because she was so out of control and unstable in that video. I wasn't meaning to really insult her. And then what I think Hannah meant by calling her a bad person is that it's immoral to want to subsist at the expense of others. Yeah, I stand by that. I think you are a bad person if you want to leech off others. Sorry. Uh, Thea says, I'm curious if you guys were planning on talking about the Riley Gaines situation at F. SFSU, love your podcast. I would really like to hear your take on the situation. Good news. Brad has responded to that um, on his own Instagram channel. So, and where else, Brad? I think a few other places. Uh, and on YouTube and a standalone video. So that's why we didn't cover it on the podcast. We do once a week. So by the time we get to something, it would be old news sometimes. So I just made a YouTube video about it. I mean, I don't know if you know the story, but basically this, she's a athlete. She competed against Leah Thomas, thinks it was unfair as a critic of trans participation in sports. Whatever you think of any of that, she was allegedly violently assaulted and she was barricaded for three hours at this campus when she tried to speak. So I think just on free speech principles, we have huge sympathy for her in that situation and zero sympathy for the protesters who tried to infringe other people's rights. All right. Scarlett says, always a great time listening to you all. I'm with you, Brad, on the Tennessee story. Hope you all have a great weekend. Well, we did. Yeah, actually, we had a great weekend. Uh, Josh says, amazing episode as always. I don't know how connected you guys are with Canadian issues or laws, but I'd love hearing your all's thoughts on Bill C-11, which brings companies like YouTube under the Canadian Broadcasting Act, making companies like YouTube show more Canadian content. Personally, as a Canadian libertarian, I think this will limit the types of content others can listen to online, especially by keeping viewpoints that aren't Canadian enough or that don't represent Canada's values. But I wouldn't mind getting a couple American perspectives on the situation. Much love as always. Now, I am not- I do concerned. know about this. You do? Okay. Yes. Good. So I wrote about this. Basically, what this is, is they're doing affirmative action for Canadian media on the social media. So the Canadian government is trying to say that like Facebook and YouTube must show you in your algorithm and your feed, a certain percentage of content produced in Canada. Um, and I, to me, it's just, 
a beginning of a slippery slope of the government controlling what you see on the internet. And it's the kind of thing that could never fly here because we have the first amendment. And I'm like, yeah, that's why I like this. That's why I like the first amendment. And I think we should keep it. I don't want the government uh, telling the companies what is allowed to appear on my searches and algorithms. Like, no, thank you. Hard pass. And they're trying to do it to, to promote Canadians, but it might actually hurt them in a, such a typical government way. Some influencers from Canada have spoken out against this. And you'll get this when I explain this, because if it, if it forces companies to push them beyond their niche uh, to people who aren't actually algorithmically well suited for their content then those people will not engage, they'll scroll past it, they'll downvote, they'll dislike it. And overall, the reach of those Canadian influencers, which most of their audience is outside Canada, will go down. So it's going to totally backfire. It's censorship. It's a hard pass. It's just like a weird form of nationalism too. Like if your content's great, then it will do well, period. You don't need a government law mandating it. That's so creepy. And I mean, Canada's awful, 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 awful on free speech issues. So this is no surprise to me whatsoever. But to be honest, when I hear these kinds of things, I'm like, if I was Facebook or I was YouTube, I would just pack up and go home. I would tell these governments <laughs> to suck it. I'd be like, let your people turn against you as they should, you authoritarian pricks. Like, absolutely not. I'm taking my YouTube videos and I'm leaving. <laughs> like, that'd be my whole energy as a company. I would so John Galt them. All right. Um, I don't know how you pronounce this handle, but they said, oh, no, quote, quote, base podcast. Now the FBI will be watching, proving that they probably should be removed as a federal police force. A freaking men. But hey, if FBI agents are watching this and we're monetizing it, I'll take it. <laughs> also, if FBI agents are watching this, like, please get based, like learn something, quit your, job. quit your jobs, be good people. Oh my gosh. <laughs> uh, all right, let's move on to hot takes. What do you got for us, Hannah? So I feel strongly, I'm, I'm an organized person. I like, I like having clean spaces and I think that's important in life, but I feel very adamantly that you can tell how intelligent somebody is by how they load a dishwasher. Not if they load the dishwasher, mm -hmm. but how they load it. Because have you ever sat there and you're trying to like load a dishwasher somebody and it's just chaos and you're like, what are you doing? Like, obviously you could fit 10 more cups in if you just went in a row, you know, just, just the basics of, of fitting things in, in a intelligent way to make sure that everything gets clean and is it fits in there. I don't understand why it's so hard, but a lot of people, I watch them load dishwashers and I judge them harshly on it. All right. Um, okay. My hot take is that flavored water is always a mistake. So you'll go to places and they'll have like cucumbers floating in their ice water. Or The only thing I think can ever be okay is lemon, but even then it doesn't need to be like soaked the fruit in the water. It's like, just put it on top and squeeze some lemon juice in. But generally flavored waters are almost always gross and just drink water. And if you want something flavored, drink some juice or a soda or something. Don't drink all this weird water stuff. I, I hate it. I'm diametrically opposed to you on this because I hate water. I can only drink it if I like add significant things to it. I was just drinking a LaCroix, as you can see throughout the show. Um, that has gross. salt in it, doesn't it? Doesn't it dehydrate you? Like, <laughs> I don't know, but I can't drink Coke or juice. That's carbs. So I'm just trying to, you know, drink things drink throughout my water. day. That <laughs> water tastes like garbage. Like, I don't understand how people actually like it. My standard water I will drink throughout the day is lemon juice, like you said, with a little bit of like Splenda or something added. So like a very light lemonade. That's the only way I can tolerate it. I think it's abhorrent. All right, guys, that's a wrap. Be sure to leave us a comment or a review. We'll read it on the show. Hope you enjoyed the episode. And until next week, stay based.